and welcome to the Chrissy Cast. Well, I didn't have to look very far for an interesting person from anywhere in the world for this one because my guest is Australian treasure, Lee Sales. I've loved Lee forever and I've so much to talk to her about. And also, I'm excited to get the opportunity to personally thank her for an email she sent me when we had never even met when I was in the depths of a pretty brutal public shaming. Welcome to the Chrissy Cast, one of my all time faves, the legendary Lee Sales. Oh, thank you so much. Now, see, if you talk about me sending you that nice email, I've got a belief in life that if you get public credit for doing a nice act, it kind of negates the nice act, right? Because then it means maybe you just did it so you could get some public praise and everyone's saying what a nice person you are. I understand what you're saying, but um, this is not public. This is just you and me. (laughs) And I don't think I have actually said to you in person how amazing it was for that to just pop into my email. I found it. Oh. I found the actual email and it is from 2013. Wow. <laughs> Can you believe it? So you and I had never met. Never met you at all. And you said, oh, hi, Chrissy. I hope you don't mind this uninvited intrusion into your inbox. <laughs> of course I did not. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to send you my best wishes and support and tell you to hang in there with all the reaction to the smoking thing. It was terrible. If you're not across it, I was caught having a sneaky fag while I was pregnant, which is a terrible thing to do. But my God, I wanted to die. And then you said, people sure do love to judge pregnant women and young mothers. And as far as I'm concerned, they can all go fuck themselves. (laughs) (laughs) And it was so nice to hear that when, you know, the the other voices were saying that my children should be taken off me, that there were, you know, new Facebook groups, you know, uh, organised to to bring me down. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, you are so welcome. That would have, did you say that was 2013? Yes. Okay, so I would have been probably pregnant myself um, because my kids were born in 2012 and 2014. Yes. And so nobody, I think, understands how... Tricky it is being a new mother than when you are right in the middle of it, right? Oh my God. You don't know what you're doing. It's the most uncomfortable you ever are. You feel like every day that you're stuffing it up. Mm. And I just, when that happened and I saw that in the paper, I just felt like, and it just went on and on and on. Mm. And I just felt so bad for you because I thought no one will be feeling, you know, more down on herself to start with than Chrissy Swan yes. and now to get all of this. Yeah. Um, and so I asked someone who knew us both, do you have an email for Chrissy Swan by any chance? And just even the tone of that, I thought I was probably enraged when I said that because it sounds like pregnant woman rage. But the thing is, what it did for me was it encouraged me to reach out to people I've never known and just say something nice. Yeah. And I think that is such an... You sort of think, oh, they don't know me, they don't care, I'm not going to do it. But they do care and it does make a difference. I think even if... If it's, you know, someone that you kind of know or like or whatever, that's nice to get encouragement from anyone. But if it's even a stranger, I think, can have a significant impact on you if you're feeling low, if they offer a word of encouragement. I've been thinking about it a bit this week, actually, with the Logies and seeing Larry M to get the gold Logie yeah. and Rebecca Gibney get acknowledged in the Hall of Fame. Mm. Now, I, I've never met Rebecca Gibney um, and I've met Larry in passing, but I don't really know him. Oh, but- they are both top shelf human beings. Yeah, right. I'm so thrilled for them both. Well, Larry Emder, and I think this sort of, you know, is a lesson for how we all conduct ourselves. As I say, I don't know Larry Emder, but kind of what I hear about Larry Emder is, and not just from, you know, other people on TV, I'm talking about from crew and producers and stuff. Larry Emder is a great guy. He's a really generous guy. He really looks after his crew and his people who work on his show. And so you hear these echoes all the time of what a nice bloke Larry Emder is and I th- and how much he, he sort of, you know, um, bends over to help people. And I think that's so good, isn't it, to just go through life being like that yeah. um, and just leaving people feeling good in your wake. Yeah. 40 years he's been doing this show. Just incredible. It is incredible. I asked him one time, like, what's your what's your secret? You're so, like, 
grateful and happy. Mm. And, and he said, I just, I never say no. I never say no and I turn up with a good attitude. And I thought that's important and that's what I say to my kids now. I'm like, just don't be an arsehole because there's always going to be somebody that can do the job better than you. Totally. But if you're a pleasure to be around, you'll always get the job. 100%. Yeah. Um, and it just, I think, makes the world a kind of better place to go through. Yes. So, yeah, um, I, I, I sort of, I think as well to just having the sense that particularly in our line of work, it can come and go um, mm-hmm. really easily. And so if you start kind of believing, well, I'm here because I deserve to be here or because I'm really good at what I do or whatever, I think that's just a recipe to disaster because things can just very suddenly change. Yeah. It's funny. I'm in talks at the moment about doing a, a TV show and it might not happen, as you know, in the biz. And somebody said to me, oh, why would you do this show? What if it gets axed? And I'm like... That is of no concern to me because the joy for me is turning up on set and chatting to the makeup girls and, yeah. you know, being cheeky with the soundies. Like, that's the experience for me. Totally. And I think you kind of, maybe it's a thing about age, but I think you reach a point in life where I, f- I certainly feel like... I want to do things where I feel connected to the work and that I'm excited by it. And whether it fails or not, I kind of want to have a go at it. Yes. Um, so, for example, this show, The Assembly. Yes, I can't wait to talk about The Assembly. Yeah, yes. that's starting this week. So it's a group of 15 autistic people who interview one prominent person, like a politician, celebrity, sporting person and so on. Yeah. And so when it came to me, of course, one of the things you think is, well, what if I mess this up? What if I misspeak? What if I say something that insults somebody? What if, you know, I do something wrong? I use the wrong word, the wrong language to describe somebody with autism. Even when I was uh, researching this, I read the sentence autistic people and I thought, is that right or should it be people with autism? I did exactly the same and I checked it. I went and checked it with the Peak Autism Group and they said it's um, autistic people. Right. But, you know, it's exactly what you say. It's things like that, that you want to be respectful and say the right thing. And sometimes the way society works these days, if you are well-intentioned but you make a mistake, then you get a pile on. Yeah. Um, And so I thought about things like that and then I felt like, but hang on, I think this is a really worthwhile and interesting project that I'd like to do and I don't want to be fearful of how people might react and that dissuading me from doing something that I think is good. Yeah. Um, It was interesting what you said before too about how Larry says yes to everything because I feel like as I've gotten older, the key to being a bit happier has been learning to say no to more things. Yes, but... And me too, and I've got to be better at that. But I am so irrationally enthusiastic, as as you describe your podcast, about so many things. And I say yes too much because I value fun and, yeah. and I can sort of identify what is going to be fun for me. Yeah, same here. But the things that I've learnt to say no to are the things that – I don't think are going to be fun, but that I feel obliged to do. Yes. So people chasing me for, oh, we must have a coffee or whatever, and I feel kind of nagged and like I'm just too busy and I can't fit it in, but then I just, I do it. I say yes just to kind of get them off my case or whatever. Yeah. I've started being firmer at prioritising, well, I need some me space sometimes and I can't keep everybody else happy the whole time. Yeah. And, in fact, I sometimes will write in my diary, like say, you know, I've been asked to go to dinner or something and I've said no because it's a busy week. I'll write in the diary, 7pm, presently, congratulates past Lee for saying no to the dinner that was happening That's right now. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> oh, do you? Or if something <laughs> works out, I go, good call, um, uh, past Chrissy, <laughs> Future Chrissy, thanks you. It's like, how do we know? I found, though, that all I want to do is um, fun things and then organise things in containers and build fires. Um, and they... You know, there's this big sort of buzz trend of self-care. Yeah. And for a long time I thought, oh, does that mean having to book in for a massage because I can't be bothered, I don't want another appointment? Um, You know, I try and treat myself to a pedicure and I cancel and cancel and cancel. But I've worked out that my personal self-care is burning things and organising things into containers. That gives me unbridled joy do you have something 
specific like that. I do, and that's so good that you have worked that out because mm. sometimes I think people aren't sure what it is. For me, um, it's music. I've always played the piano, but a couple of years ago I started learning the cello and I find it very meditative um, and I don't know if it's because it's so different to what I do in my job because mm. um, it's using like hand-eye coordination, yeah. obviously. Um, <coughs> I like cooking a lot as well and oddly I find cooking and music not dissimilar because you're reading instructions on a piece of paper in front of you and you're translating what you're seeing there into actions with your hands. It's often rhythmic um, and then something nice is produced at the end of it. This is so interesting because I find if I've got things that I need to do, and I think this is how I discovered how walking changed my life, if I'm not doing anything with my hands or something auxiliary, I can't think, I can't do anything. I need to be doing something in order to think and sometimes that's walking or sometimes it's cooking and I solve all my problems. It's like I have to get started doing something and then my brain starts working. That's so interesting. So is it because you're taking the pressure off to a degree because you're not just going, right, I need to think about this problem, that there's something else going on? Or what I is think it? my... I mean, I don't know, but my gut feel is that my body needs to be moving in order for my brain to move. That's so interesting. Yeah. I wonder if there's, I bet you there's some science or something that would actually explain that. Because that is absolute fact for Mm. me, like completely. I'm surprised to hear that you like cooking because your podcast, um, Chat 10 Looks 3, um, you are the (laughs) anti-chef. When did this happen? I do. I love cooking. What what I'm anti is having to race around and find weird ingredients. Crabs forever cooking with, you know, you need one... Star anise, Sam Payne (laughs) says. As soon as he hits star anise on the recipe, it's out. (laughs) I I can deal with star anise. I can't deal with, like... Crab had this recipe with had this thing called kefala graveria, and I was like, what, "That's someone who won, <laughs> won Wimbledon in 1983." Like, Is that what? a Greek cheese? It's a Greek cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, mate, I am not driving around to find that. Like, oh no, Parmesan will do <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so I don't kind of like that sort of stuff, but I do enjoy the process of cooking, and obviously, I also enjoy eating. Um, but cello, just to go back to that, yeah, is. Um, the thing that helps me out is not what you just described about having activity. It's doing an activity that takes enough concentration that it breaks my brain out of whatever I'm ruminating on at work or whatever's worrying me so that mm. it gives me a break from my regular you know, thought patterns. So I need something that absorbs my brain basically to slow down my thought process. Right. Like a distraction almost. Like a distraction. And so that's why I say it feels kind of meditative because it's kind of, I guess you're getting into like a flow kind of state mm. um, and there's no shortcutting of the process with music practice either. Like you have to just be in it and doing it. It worries me. I've got, I know that you've got kids. How old are they? 12 and 10. Okay. So I've got an 11 year old and I have noticed that her attention span is approximately four seconds. Yeah. She doesn't like to read. She doesn't like to do anything that requires even a modicum of concentration. And I worry about that. I think we might be moving into an era where jobs and life and everything is going to change to suit short attention span because mm. I think a lot of pe- I mean I think my attention span's shorter than it Mine used to too. be. Yeah. So I think that the nature of technology is shortening attention spans and that's going to be interesting to see then well how a workplace is designed and what do we end up, you know, doing around that. Mm. You are so busy and I mean, you, you're an author, journalist, TV host, podcaster, mother, all, all of those things. What is your internal voice saying when people complain about how busy or tired they are? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, firstly, nobody really cares. Is the first. I feel like it's a kind of 
boring topic of conversation because I think we all kind of feel busy, right? Yes. I think we all feel busy. And so it's kind of I, – I catch myself saying it because I'll be like, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so tired. And I just think, well, it's your choice to do what you That's do. That's right. So I try to kind of when I'm feeling like, oh, I've got so much on, I'm so busy, to say to myself, this is how you choose to be. Mm. And to be honest – I, I kind of often go through these patches where I go, right, the next six months I'm going to, after this busy patch, I'm going to keep that diary empty and I'm not going to put oh anything in Oh, my God, I'm the same. I have, I don't, I've lost a count of the amounts of time I said, after I get through this, <laughs> life's going to be. I've been saying that for over 20 years. I know, and it just kind of stays busy, but I've kind of reached a position where I feel like, you know what, I enjoy being busy and a bit like you, I have a lot of things going on that I find really fun and that I feel like I'd hate to get to the end of my life and think well I could have gone to London and done a chat 10 show but I felt like I needed to keep some space in my diary I, yeah. I kind of I like having the adventures and doing you know the different things and you know people often talk about on nobody on their deathbed says they wishes they'd spent more time at work I actually think on my deathbed I'm going to go I am so grateful for the most fascinating, interesting job that I had and all the great adventures it gave me and what a lucky, lucky person Absolutely. I was. Absolutely, I accepted for a long time that mantra that, you know, you are not your work. Work is just something you do, not who you are. And I felt very, like, relieved when I admitted to myself and others that that doesn't apply to me. I am my work. Right. I am. It's so important to me. It's my hobby. It's my fun. It's my connection. It's everything. And I feel really lucky, actually, that that, that is the case. That's, again, so good that you've been able to accept that because I feel the same about that as well although I did obviously when I left 7.30 kind of rethink my relationship to work and what I wanted out of work and mm. I think it's a process that evolves you know throughout your life yeah but I think so often it's easy to to fall into the trap of thinking um oh well people think I'm a workaholic or people think this and, that. and it's it's kind of like no no that's irrelevant it's what do you want and what do you think and what's right for you and your family and so on I think it's irrelevant what people think about anything you do in your life. Mm. Yeah. And I think once you really realise that, there's so, such freedom and happiness. Totally. As, as I said in 2013. They can just all go fuck themselves. Yeah, because nobody's <laughs> nobody's in it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's your life. You're the one who's living it. And that's the thing for me when I was saying like social obligations, if I feel overwhelmed and, and I don't want to do, the person who pays the price for that is me. And also I, I feel conscious often that my children, right, any, any time that I don't spend with me and my children and that I make a choice to do something else, that's taking me, you know, away from them. And yeah. so I also always kind of try to think, all right, well, who do I want to make happy here? Me and my children. And then, you know, obviously my close circle of friends and people I'm, I'm tight with and so on. But after that, I feel like I don't really have obligations to make everyone else happy, whether, no. they, whether they like me or not for it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What are your top four priorities? I, I worked mine out and when I get overwhelmed and crazy, I sort of revisit that and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I've established that these are my priorities. Do you mean like values or like things to do or? I guess people and reservoirs for your energy. Right. Mine are kids, yep. work, me, everything else. Yeah. And sometimes the last, me is the hardest Yeah. to to squeeze in there. I, I would agree with that. I, I was thinking my friends... Um, are very very important to me, um, and I have I'm lucky enough that I have some really old you know long standing friendships, and I they are just super valuable, yes. and so I do particularly in the past few years, I don't know if it's been turning 50 or something, but I've really made an effort to make sure I spend quality time with people who are important to me. How do you do that? Is it a phone call? Well, so for example, my oldest friend from school, who lived around the corner and we met when we were nine, that's one of those friendships where you can not talk for a long time, but then you just kind of pick up where you left off and you just jabber on forever. So we decided this year... We went away with our families for our 40th and then we just turned 50. So we said, let's go away for a weekend. And so we went to Kangaroo Valley in New South Wales. So she just flew, she flew down from Queensland. We had three or four days away. And so you just hang out. 
Um, yeah. But we don't do that very often. Um, but that was just a really lovely thing to do. Um, Are you a phone call person? I find it very hard. Less and less. Yeah. I used to be in my 20s, but now I'm more kind of like I prefer to text because I can squeeze it in as I'm doing other things. Yeah. I don't like the question, how was your day? I don't want to talk about it. I've lived it. Oh, that's interesting. Nobody really ever asks me how was my day because <laughs> my children don't give us stuff. <laughs> they, they ask me, Mum, what's for dinner? <laughs> yes, absolutely, and mine too, and I'm grateful for that because I don't want to go through a blow by blow, blow, blow account of all the stuff I've done. I've I, done it. I wonder sometimes as well if it's because you and I talk all day in our jobs and so you're kind of a bit talked out. Yeah, yeah, I've got nothing to say. Yeah, I've got nothing. You to just say. kind of want, want a bit of peace. You know how I wear a bum bag all the time. Mm-hmm. It's changed my life. Really, and I am going to give you one before you go. Okay, why? But, uh, why? Why has it changed your life? Because yeah. I have everything I need on me. Ah, oh. and I strapped one on a few years ago, and an entire field of worry was just lifted off my head and people wow. people are always like, why are you always wearing a bum bag? I'm like, because I can't live without it. It's got my keys, it's got my phone, it's got everything. I never have to go, oh, shit. Where is it? I've forgotten it, yeah. And because Your it's... hands are free. Yes, yeah. and it's a bird's eye view. When I open it, I can see everything. Okay, all right. It's magical and I'm going to give you one. Okay. But as part of the Chrissy cast, I play a game called What's in the Belly Bag. <laughs> yeah. And I'm... We're going to trick it up because the <laughs> item I have in here doesn't fit in it. <laughs> okay. But I'm going to hand you the belly bag and then you're going to open it and then I'm going to reveal what is <laughs> okay. logist- is All right. inside it's logistically it. Okay. in there. Okay. All right, Lee All Sales, right. Okay. what's Allah. in the belly bag? What is in the belly bag is... <gasps> A bunt tin. Oh, a bunt tin. It's a beautiful bunt tin. What does that mean to you? Okay, it reminds me immediately of Annabelle Crabb mm-hmm. and this in joke that we've got where we call people smug bunts. <laughs> <laughs> now let's just clarify the spelling. It is B U N D T. <laughs> That's right. It's like one of those molded kind of German cakes that you sprinkle icing sugar on. So we were shooting a show, um, oh, it must have been 20. 20- 16, 15, called When I Get a Minute. And there's an episode where I make a cake in a bunt tin and we do, as Crab calls it, the dismount. Mm. And a <laughs> bunt tin, if you haven't greased it properly because of all the little patterns, it's hard to get it out. What's anyway. your tip to grease it? Is it just lots of butter? Y- melted, yeah. Oh. Yeah, and using a brush. Painted on. Yeah, painted on to get into all <gasps> the little tip. nooks and cr- nooks and crannies. Yeah. And then let it cool a bit because it'll shrink a little bit. So and then flip it up and and off you go. And so when I did on the TV show the dismount, obviously you know many a time I've done a bunt cake and half it remains in the tin. Yes. And um, it came out absolutely flawlessly. And Crab just on the spot went, "You smug bunt." <laughs> uh, your podcast is extraordinary. What does it mean to you? Is it a sense of, are you astonished by the sense of community? Absolutely astonished. And this is a classic example of what you were talking about before about saying yes to something because it sounds fun and not really having any plan or sense of where it might go. So when it started 10 years ago, it was just us talking into a phone and kind of like this actually, just recording a free-flowing conversation. Yeah. And then it just kind of built and built and then people... The way people would interact with us in public, we started feeling like, gee, I feel like there's people listening to this. Mm. And then we set up a Facebook group so that we weren't the spokes, we weren't the centre of all the spokes so they could communicate with each other. Great. And then that created a real community basically around it. And it's I often, when I think of my career, it's one of the things, I feel like if I walked out of here and dropped dead today, mm. I do think it's one of the things that I'm the most proud of because I feel like it has made a tangible, positive difference to people. Yeah. Um, and I've, I'm so grateful and thrilled and just surprised by that. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's wonderful. Me and my friends just can't get enough of it. <laughs> oh, that's Never, good. ever stop. <laughs> Just before we hit record on this, we were talking about our uh, lack of trust in our own <laughs> skills. <laughs> and last night, I mean, I've been putting aside bits and pieces of information 
about this podcast with you for weeks and I even enlisted the help of my daughter last night. I said, do you want to, do you want to assist me? And then she had a, a, an old exercise book and her one question to you was, what was it like being a um, correspondent in Washington oh. from 2000 and something? I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's I question. didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So answer that and then we'll yes. move on to our mistrust of our own abilities. Um, so that was really an amazing life experience. So I was about 28. It was just after 9-11 and I went for four years to be the ABC's Washington correspondent. Mm -hmm. So it was just, I mean, it feels like when you live in Washington that you're living in a movie, right? Because you're in a cab and you see the White House or the Capitol or whatever. And so that never wore off for me. Or you'd be driving to the airport and you pass the sign for the CIA at Langley. It's just like, I feel like I'm living in a movie. Yeah. So that that was kind of thrilling. Things like if you'd go to the Pentagon for a story, I'd be just trying to seem cool, but I'd be like, I'm in the it's so cool. <laughs> so cool. Um, so that was just a really brilliant experience. At one of the best things, other than that the job was interesting, was my dearest friend Lisa Miller was posted at the same time in Washington. Oh, amazing. So we just had the greatest time. It was just Did you awesome. share an apartment and all that sort of we stuff? We were both married at the time, so we lived around the corner from each other, um, And but we were in each other's pockets, you know, nonstop. It was fantastic. Neither marriage has survived, but the friendship has. <laughs> Well, that's the important thing. (laughs) Do you believe that romantic love exists? I know that your friends are very important to you and to me too and the love I feel for them and the love I feel for my kids is like unconditional. What do you think about partner love? I think that's a really interesting question. It's mm. something my friends and I talk about a lot yeah. about that, particularly if you've been married before and would you do it again kind of thing. Mm. Um, I think that I read this article recently about this group of people in France who were single and they decided they were going to have a dinner every Sunday night and attempt with their friendship group to replicate the dynamic of a family. And oh, my God, were- I just panicked at the idea of something every Sunday <laughs> night. Yeah, like, no, no, no way. <laughs> I'm saying now, future Christy says, sorry, I can't make it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and that, that their theory was um, friendship is the new kind of primary relationship that we expect too much from our our romantic partners, that we expect our romantic partners to meet every kind of need in our life, mm. but actually you need multiple people to meet different needs. And I kind of feel like I'm a bit of a subscriber to that view Yes, I don't kind of believe, you, you watch, now that I say this, I'll walk out of here and meet eyes with some bus driver and fall helplessly in love, <laughs> love at sight. but I kind of tend to think I don't believe that one person's going to fill the great hole in your life kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. But I think the the key there is finding somebody that agrees with that and doesn't want you all to themselves. Yeah, exactly. So I guess you'd have to ensure that you were partnered with someone who gave you who, enough space. Yeah, who and- also understands that th- that is the dynamic. That, yeah. You know, it's, it's not cheating if you want to go away for a weekend with your girlfriends. I was thinking of exactly that yeah. example where you need the kind of space to be able to do, um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, And I, I'm also a big believer too in that certain relationships can be for a season, that just because something yeah. doesn't last for a whole lifetime, friendship or romantic relationship, I it doesn't agree. mean it's a failure. I, I never think that any relationship, no matter how long it lasts or how short it is, is a failure or you know, a disaster. Yeah. There's such great things about everything. Yeah, I agree. Um, That was the only question my daughter came up with because um, (laughs) of her aforementioned attention span. Um, Yeah, so I have, you know, turned myself inside out doing research for this podcast and, of course, almost nothing that I took hours planning has been touched on or will be. (laughs) But that's the sign of a good interview. Is it? It is, Chrissy, because my experience with interviewing is... To have the confidence to get out there, I need, and it sounds like you do too, the security blanket of having done the preparation. And so I, I go in with like, okay, well, this would be my list of questions. Uh, this is what I know about this person. And that gives me the confidence to go out there. Yeah. But really what you're hoping for is that you hardly have to look at that because the conversation just keeps flowing. Yes. But I don't, I don't have the guts to kind of just rely on the information in my head to do that. No, either do I. Even though it's in there and I've prepped it. Yeah, and every time, like even with you, you know, I've been a fan for so long. I know so much about you. I, I consume so much of what you do 
and I just never acknowledge that my curiosity will get me through. Yeah, but it would. Do you know, so Richard Glover um, hosts ABC Drive in Sydney mm. and he is like us. He always preps. I do a weekly thing with him. Yeah. And we had this one time we were talking about exactly this and I said, okay, I'm setting us a challenge. Next Monday is no prep Monday. No <sighs> prepping for either of us. You have We have to just walk in and for our half hour we just have to talk. And Did it, either of you sneakily? We, we didn't, <laughs> but when I walked in, Richard said... I think what I'll start with, and I went, no, Richard, that's prep. Like, no prep. We've got to do it. We, I think we both found it incredibly difficult. But, of course, once you get going, if you've got chemistry, you can just talk. Yeah, exactly. And, like, you think, right, if you go to a pub with a friend or say if we were meeting for a coffee, you wouldn't think, oh, I'm meeting Lee for a coffee. I better do some prep. You would then just think we could have a conversation. Yes, so- and just have everything crossed that you don't say, how was your day? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's right. I'm so busy. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. <laughs> Speaking about being busy and tired, when I first started Breakfast Radio 21 years ago, can you believe? I was so tired, I couldn't believe it. I oh. Every day I felt like, you know, on those gorgeous childhood days where you swim all day in your friend's above ground pool yep. and then it hits five o'clock and you, your eyes are stinging and yep. you're so tired and you're a bit, you know, yep. warm from the sun. Every single day I felt like that and I couldn't believe it and I would not shut up about it. (laughs) And then I realised about two years in from just complaining, I was just like, hang on, I complain about this every day to anybody with a set of ears (laughs) (laughs) and I'm not any less tired. It's not fixing it. So I decided to stop talking about it Mm. and that alone has made the biggest difference because That's now so I'm even more tired <laughs> and more busy. But if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. That's very interesting. I, I once had a friend who sadly has now passed away, uh, Mark Colvin, who used to be a journalist at the ABC, mm. and he had had really bad health for about 25 years. He contracted a horrible virus when he was working as a correspondent in Africa and his health had kind of been decimated by it, mm. um, ended up having a kidney transplant and so on. And he, when he was a young man, he was a very handsome, dashing foreign correspondent, beautiful British accent, mm. all of that kind of vibe. James Bond, yeah. James Bondy. And then his illness had kind of robbed his mobility, his looks, everything except his brilliant brain, basically. Wow. And I found this kind of interesting. And, and But he would very rarely talk about, even though he's in constant pain, never really talked about it, didn't talk about being ill. And one day we were in the car and I said, um, Colvin, like, I'm always kind of curious, like, what effect it's had on you, your illness. And he said... And I said, but you never talk about it. And he said, no, sales, because it's just so boring. He said, there's nothing more boring than being in constant pain and being ill. It's boring for me and I just don't want it to be boring for everybody else. And I just thought, God, isn't that incredible? Because he was ex- an extremely interesting person and great company. And I thought that was fascinating that he'd made a conscious decision like, yes, I'm in constant pain, but I'm just going to not talk about it. Yeah. And it made him, in my view, you know, almost an heroic person to to just push through life like that. Yeah, to not complain is a big ask. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about this new show. Yes. Um, It's called The Assembly. Now, you have said of your new show uh, where 15 autistic people are given carte blanche to interview celebs, beautiful, like Hamish Blake, Sam Neill, et cetera, um, that, one element of what you loved about it was that it shows what people can achieve if they're given a go. Yeah. And I've always said it just takes one person to champion you and you're away. Do you have that one person that sort of identified something in you as a young person and went, she's got something? I think... Probably not one person, but I feel like when I look back over my career, there's been multiple people who gave me a go at doing things when my experience on paper wouldn't have really justified the confidence or the even being given a shot, but they gave me a shot. So when I um, first started, my first job was at Channel 9 in Brisbane. And so I had, like everyone does as their junior job, you know, I'd answer the phone to viewers, complaints Mm. and send the crews out and print scripts and do whatever was required, roll the autocue. 
And um, there was a woman named Elizabeth Egan who was one of the reporters and she let me sort of research a few stories and she actually, she didn't just kind of take the research, she'd give me some tips. And so she was actually really encouraging and sort of helped me a lot learn, you know, in a very active mentory kind mm. of way. Um, and then when I went to the ABC, um, I mean, even just getting the job at the ABC was kind of because I hadn't had any reporting experience at nine. Yeah. So getting in at this junior, what was at the time, a D grade, that was a punt that they took on me mm. and I'm still in touch with the boss who gave me that that gig, John mm. Cameron. Um, and then I think going to Washington, as I said, I was 27 turning 28. On paper, I didn't have all of that experience, but it was the same boss, Camo, uh, and another boss, Max Utrecht, who kind of were like, we think that you can do it. And yeah. I think nothing... Nothing propels you to deliver than like when someone's put some faith in you and that they're trusting that you can do it. I agree. Have you ever been that person for someone? I hope so. Um, I try. A lot of people want me to mentor them Mm. um, and I have a few people in the ABC that I do that with on an ongoing basis and then sometimes I just do one-off things with people. Um, What I've kind of... I find that that's a very... um, That's a difficult request. It is, 100% it is. Because I feel like, so for me, um, in advertising, the people that saw something in me and really, you know, gave me an opportunity, one was Jeffrey Booth and another one was Steve Hurley. And you can always, you can always name the the people that help you. Mm. And in radio, it was Mike Perso who just hounded me and hounded me. And I'm so glad he did because, oh, my God, it's so wonderful. Mm. But when you – I feel like when – because I get approached as well, uh, you know, by young people wanting a career in the media, but I think it needs to be organic. Yeah. Same here. Um, I – I don't generally do it when people say, can you please mentor me? It's It usually evolves from somebody that I've been in a team with or something, already know them a little bit, and you have a certain connection that means it can kind of go yeah. from there. There's a couple of exceptions to that, but generally that's how um, it works. But- because you also have to identify where, because you don't know everything about everything, yeah. and I don't know everything about everything, so you need to identify the sort of person that you can help. Totally. And I think as well what I've noticed with, say, um, you know, people in their 20s that I mentor Mm. um, is... I think actually sometimes all they want is just someone to listen to them and to just go, you're doing great. Yeah. You're going to be fine. I I don't think they need someone to go, well, here's how you do an interview. Yeah. I sometimes think they just want to bounce ideas off somebody and have like an environment where someone just gives them an hour of listening time and just encourages them that things will work out okay. Because I think too, in your 20s sometimes, every decision like about taking a certain job or whatever, you feel like, oh, it's a big life-changing decision. Yes. But you realise when you're older, there's kind of no right or wrong decisions. There's just, just all different paths that you know, Yeah, you and you can down. leapfrog to the side yeah. and go back a bit and start again. Yeah, take Absolutely. a bit of time out if you need to, you know. Now, the assembly. Yes, sorry. We in your track. own words again. <laughs> yes. The assembly is people asking whatever they like, no questions are off limits. Yes. So let's try some. <laughs> Lee Sales, how much money do you have in dollars and cents? <laughs> <laughs> that was a question that got asked of Hamish Blake. Could anyone do it to the cents? I mean, I don't think so. Also, like it depends on what direct debits are coming out. It depends <laughs> yeah, on totally. what you owe. Who knows? Do you have any cash in that bum bag of yours? Not a penny. I haven't had Me cash either. for years. Same. Yeah, not at all. It's terrible. In fact, I didn't even bring anything down to Melbourne other than my phone. I didn't bring any cards at all. Oh, see, I have a little folder in here with all my <laughs> cards just in case phone goes the, it doesn't work. Yeah. When was the last time you had a proper pash? Oh, not that long ago. <laughs> Good. I don't want to go into too many details. No, you must yeah, not go recently. into details. Good. Yeah. Good news. Do your toenails look like something that you would find on a hobbit? Yes. Mine too. Somewhere, somewhere between hobbit and acceptable. Not full-scale hobbit, but not great. Are they painted? No. No. <laughs> You're a disgrace. <laughs> uh, what is the most shameful thing you've served up and called dinner? Oh, like packet fish fingers and just stuff like that. You know what you can do to <laughs> zhuzh that up in what? no time? Because I'm the shortcut queen. <laughs> yeah. Right? 
I also love a fish finger, but sometimes I elevate them to the sort of slightly wedge-shaped fillets. <laughs> They're fish fingers. They're just a bit bigger. You cook them exactly the same way and then you get your tortillas oh. and you chop them up oh. and a bit of chipotle and then you've got a fish taco. Annabelle Crabb does that. Does she? She does, yep. She Fancy is such you two. a smug Fancy. bunt. Fancy, such a smug bunt. When you imagine yourself at 70, what is the image that you can conjure? I like to think smiling, having a great time, and for me, and so I, I don't judge anyone else, having a wrinkly, lived-in face. And grey hair? That's a good question. I think at, at age 51, I feel like yes, but I bet, but you better ask me at 69. I reckon I might feel differently yeah. as I get closer. I just feel like I'm not ready to let it go yet. I love all the you know, Nivea and Dove campaigns with Same. all this beautiful grey hair, but I'm just not ready. I also don't think I'm going to have beautiful grey hair. I think I'm going to have really foul, nondescript <laughs> colour grey hair. The frizz is I'll, real. I'll still have to get colour put in my hair to make it look like nice grey hair. Absolutely. <laughs> me too. That blue, the purple shampoo. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me, Lisa. I know you've got a plane to catch. It's been so fun. Thank you for having me. Adorable, smart, insightful and a bit naughty too. What a woman. You can catch Lee's amazing new TV show, The Assembly. It's available from August 20th. 20 on the ABC and ABC iView. And don't forget to follow me on the Chrissy Car Social on Instagram for all sorts of bits and bobs. You can DM me anytime, by the way. I run it because I don't have a life. Till next time, <laughs> Chrissy Casters, stay amazing.